fairy tales. There's not very many of them. Okay. Hi, Sophia. Wh where are you from, by the way, Sophia? Hey, this is my first time attending this call, so. <laughs> okay, great. Where are you from? Exactly. I'm from Georgia, the country, but I live in New York City. Okay, great. Yeah, well, this is uh, very important to me. I don't know. It's, uh, it, it, you know, um, it, it relates to the, uh, to the archetype of life, which is the anima, and the archetype of meaning, which is the animus, and how, how together they create life. Now, Annette mentioned last time uh, the layers and layers and layers that you find here. And uh, at the end of this uh, great work that she does, that uh, Emma Young does here, which I can't imagine she didn't get help from her husband, um, she apologizes that she never discussed Sophia. <laughs> I mean, not you personally, but uh, the goddess of wisdom, you know. And uh, anyway, um, so we're, we're going to be doing, and now I'll just get started because it's it's important, I think, to review this because there's so many subtleties and insights in it. It's crazy, you know. Now she called the book, uh, this section, um, Natur Wesson, which means nature beings. But uh, in English, they translated it as anima, as the elemental being. But I think it's, you know, a lot of times we think of elemental beings as elves and fairies and um, say, um, you know, what um, Carlos Castaneda called, uh, you know, Don Juan, you know, it's this uh, psychoid figures. Uh, but she's um, is focusing on nature beings. And I think that the, the, the way she's approaching it is the historical um, experience of the anima as the archetype of life in European history, at least. You know, she brings in a little bit from, uh, from uh, the Vedas, but the Vedas are Indo-Aryans as well. Uh, you know, they come from, Indo-Aryans are these horse peoples of Euro, Eurasia, you know. I mean, they, they, there was a, this whole area from the subcontinent up, up to the steppes and in, over the Urals and into uh, uh, the peninsula of Europe where uh, ha all share the same language family. And uh, so they know that they uh, originally were one peoples. And the reason they're called Aryans is because they were horse people. They rode horses, you know. Um, in fact, there were some that would drink the blood of the horse when they rode because they didn't have time to get off. You know, that's, you know, they do that today too with camels sometimes, you know, but anyway, we're going to get started. Hi, Gary and Tim and uh, Dawn and Annette. This is, this is going to be important. So I'm going to uh, just try to get through it here. Uh, it's just going over the whole anima thing. Okay. Nature beings. Now she's going to discuss swan maidens, water beings, uh, uh, be, uh, the, the anima as it appears as a serpent, the anima as it appears as beasts of prey, and the anima as it appears as tree nymphs, you know, so, but they are nature beings, okay? Now, these are these half human aspects of consciousness within us uh, that um, uh, have been left behind by consciousness, because we were once a nature being. And when our consciousness left uh, nature, nature, your, your body and, and the wisdom of your body didn't change. You, it didn't leave, you left it. And now it wants to reconnect with you. And so that's why they're half human and they're always represented in the images by some kind of nature aspect. So the first one we're going to discuss is the ones in bird form. Hi, Jorge. I'm glad you made it. I'm sorry if we screwed you up last time, but we're just getting started. We're just going to kind of review, uh, which was, I think, about 80 pages or so, or maybe 50 pages of the, of the anima uh, uh, as a nature being. 
So the first we're going to discuss are swan maidens, and swan maidens are very ancient, you know, just absolutely found everywhere. Uh, you know, they are, uh, here's, let me see, we got this one. Uh, this, this is um, Aphrodite, okay, and she's riding a swan, you know, and uh, then there is a, uh, I showed this one last time of the, uh, of, there was a Danish burial of, uh, from 5000 BC, where this uh, woman is, is buried on uh, uh, a swan's wing. You know, uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful image. If I can, I'm not sure if I can find it quickly here, but anyway, it is, it's a very ancient image. The swan is a, uh, at least the uh, tundra, I mean the mute, or the trumpeter swan is um, uh, its flesh is completely black, and its uh, uh, skin or, or its feathers are completely white. So it is a uh, uh, you, you know it's it's this creature of of both black and white. You can't really find that. Oh, here it is. Here it is. See now this is from about this is from seven thousand years ago in Denmark. This is burial on a swan's wing. So it's just ancient uh, form uh, of, uh, of being, uh, you know. And it, and it represents, again, the archetype of life. And, uh, and the, 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 what Annette mentions about the layers and layers, if we can get through this, you're going to find, find out uh, the great mystery, the X-ray of of life coming into being that comes through the anima, the animus, and uh, the unconscious in, in our uh, psyche. So anyway, the nature beings are these swan maidens, draw men after them. They, uh, the yearning desire for new undertakings. That's uh, one thing that swan did. Uh, it usually was one that led to battle, but, um, also to love and to achievement. And it's, it's the uh, first felt in the unconscious uh, is emotional steering, stirrings, vague impulses, and unexplainable moods to go and do something great, you know, uh, to, to, to accomplish something, go, you know, uh, a, a heroic, it's sort of the hero journey is initiated by, uh, um, this uh, image of the feminine as bird, half human, half bird, anima. Uh, later, we'll find out the water beings, they're not exactly the same, you know, uh, as far as their unconscious stirrings. The impulse acts like an intuition, disclosing new possibilities and leading uh, uh, men to pursue and grasp them. And it's also seen in, um, now this is at, at, at the edge, age, age of courtly love, we switch from swan maidens to, to uh, water beings, okay, in, in fairy tales for some reason. I don't, I, I think we can probably uh, figure it out. Actually, she does say it's because the feminine has become more differentiated in the 12th and 13th centuries than it was, uh, say, in Charlemagne's time. You know, Charlemagne, um, actually, uh, there was a swan maiden who was uh, involved in the uh, founding of his city in Aachen, you know, and uh, he supposedly made love to her, you know, and uh, that's where Aachen got its name. That's the, the uh, legend, you know, but um, in, in courtly love, the lady wears her token. She bestows the, um, the, her um, gerdon of victory, which is her love or her kiss. Uh, it's a fraud adventure. It's evidence that uh, the Mrs. Adventure or the, the lady of adventure, uh, the evidence that man's love of adventure is personified in the anima. 
and uh, it was originally this uh, swan maiden, the Valkyries of, uh, of Norse and Germanic religions, uh, which, which li literally means slain choosers, you know, the ones who die in battle is what it means. That's what the word Valkyrie means, you know. But um, anyway, uh, the, it also, um, this, uh, this call has redemptive aspects. There is a need for redemption. It's not just a need for adventure, but there's a need for redemption behind uh, this elemental being, this swan maiden. A higher state of being within us must be redeemed um, with uh, tested by the experience of the adventure. Which, uh, which unites an original state of unity and wholeness um, you, um, can end by and uh, end this enchantment through uh, the adventure. It, and it's uh, you, you unite with the feminine who is the inspiratis of the adventure in the first place through, uh, uh, through proving yourself through her call you become united with her and uh, uh this um you have recreated the unity which um uh now this is real very interesting and this is really getting into the mystery of of, of the uh, archetype of life and the archetype of meaning which is the animus the demands of life and ego development of uh, and of consciousness destroyed the original unity you know, and this is uh, this is every creation story tells this. Eve and Adam and Eve leaving Eden. Uh, every creation story tells you this, and it also comes from uh, uh, this this poem by Wordsworth. You know, there was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth, uh, uh, every common sight to me did seem celestial life. Okay, now this was before the ego developed. It is now, it is not now as it's been of yore, the things I saw I see no more. Shades of the prison house closed upon the growing boy. At length it seemed to die away and fade into the common day. No longer do you behold the celestial light. You know, now this is, uh, has to do with um, the very necessary development and interplay of, of ego uh, separating from nature and then returning to it uh, through the end. And, and uh, we'll talk about the archetypes here in a second. But um, the, the same thing happens in differentiating. Okay, that I, I, this is very important. This, in this development, and by, hey, hi, Jan, I forgot to say hi when you came in. This, this, development of ego and consciousness which destroyed the original unity left behind in its original state the feminine the anima the archetype of life it never changed it remained but it remained in the state that it was was when ego differentiated from it it's never changed that's why it's half human why it's a nature being or an elemental being now the same thing happens in in differentiating uh, the functions. The the all the functions uh, Jung said consciousness came into being when four functions uh, differentiated themselves. And there's two that just happened to us. That is sensation and intuition. You know, sensation uh, the the um, is the uh, experience of the outer world that just happens to us. Intish, intuition is the experience of the inner world that just happens to us. It's the only one of the four functions that doesn't exist in time and space. The other two functions are the ones of, of, of really of consciousness. And uh, one is of thinking and discriminating it's the principle of order, and the other one is the principle of, of relatedness, of, of feeling. Feeling, actually, it is more called the uh, 
function of valuation. Do you undervalue this or do you overvalue it? How do you value it? You know, that's that's what dealing function is. Now it, it is, there is, a, and you will find uh, when we bring in a little a bit of James Hillman that we have to keep eros straight from the feeling function, straight from the anima. They're not the same thing, you know. Logos is not the same thing as the thinking function. They have affinities for it, but they're not the same thing. So it's important to understand this layers and layers, as Annette says, to uh, to keep those separate. But anyway, the dominant function strays from the natural state, from the original state. And so the inferior function remains in its natural state. And when we encounter it in dreams or in the outer world, it tends to be very primitive. It's not been refined and developed. That's why when I try to fix things, it's my uh, inferior function is sensation. My wife says I start to curse unconsciously. I'm not doing it. That's the only time I curse. And because I, I really uh, you know, fell into a primitive function, one that's remained in its natural state. You know, so um, the inferior function is also you has some connections with the anima. I mean, I, I'm not sure about this, but, you know, since I'm a I am an intuitive thinking person, introverted, intuitive thinking, my anima, I guess, would be more extroverted, sensate with the feeling function. You know, the other half, the unconscious half of me that's related to the functions if, if the anima is related to the function. Now, our redemption and unity is achieved by recognizing and integrating these unknown elements of soul, okay? So in other words, we're not a mandala. We are not, we are not a, a, a symmetrical being. We are a broken being with either just one, you know, I was telling uh, Gary and Charles, I had this dream of a, a table, that only had one section of the pie on the table and the other three sections of the table were missing, you know? So it, it was showing that, um, you know, I was really not very symmetrical, you know? Now uh, the separation of, of the pair has to do sometimes with the mother, you know, there's a hidden relationship between the mother and the anima, you know, uh, often met in actuality. In a lot of these tales, um, you know, the swan, the, the hero steals the swan mantle from the, from the uh, swan maiden as she's bathing. And then he walks off with it. And so she's forced to follow him. And then she hides it. He hides it. And then uh, everything goes along fine for a long time. And then suddenly the mother-in-law, or the mother, his mother, finds the box that it's in, takes it out. The swan maiden sees it and she flies off to the fairy hill, you know. And then as uh, in, in the in legend of Angus that Annette told us about last time, the only way that ego consciousness can unite now with the swan maiden is to become a swan himself. And once he's become a swan, then he and the swan maiden can now visit both worlds. But um, the, the reason it often doesn't occur, what she was calling, uh, all of them seem to end where the, the, there's the love uh, match never happens. It's because the ego consciousness won't become a swan, you know. So um, anyway, the, now uh, the, that's one aspect. And we find this in actuality. Uh, Emma Young says that sometimes the mother likes to interfere in the relationship between a woman and her husband, you know, and, uh, but she says, on the other hand, it is also a tendency of the great mother to call back those who belong to her, to the swan maidens. Now, now uh, the swan maidens are of a higher order than, um, than the, than the uh, personal anima or of the water beings or the other uh, elemental beings. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, they're white. They, you know, have our tremendous flyers. 
and they tend to be aloof to man. You know, they don't really seek man out. Man seeks them out, you know. And the bird symbolizes uh, not only the animal quality of the, of the nature being, but also the intimation and the hint of unawakened spiritual potentialities of the, uh, of the earth and the feminine realms. You know, um, this, this is, uh, there, this is, we're going to get into this in what's called the lumen natura, the light of nature. It's different than the light, celestial light. You know, it's a different light. Now, uh, now we are going to move um, from the swan maidens now to the water beings. I, I'm really condensing this, but I think it's good to talk about each part of it. The, the water beings like swan maidens. Now these would be the mermaids, uh, what in, in fresh water would be called nixies. You know, uh, the, in, the, 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 the mermaids tend to be in the sea and the uh, nixies, I don't think there's a lot of difference except that they're found in, in lakes and rivers. And by the way, Morgan La Fay, uh, uh, who was related to uh, Merlin, was a, a uh, Nixie. Uh, like um, swan maidens, they possess knowledge of natural things, but they emphasize the eros factor. Unlike the swan maiden, who's you know is this uh, intimation of unawakened spiritual potentialities, the water beings tend to emphasize the eros factor. Now. What they are doing, you know, basically is to, um, these are these uh, unconscious contents that long for the light, that long for the, uh, the attention of ego awareness, and they long for the love relationship of, of the ego awareness. But again, they're half human, half fish, half serpent, and uh, uh, they are, they they're in they're in their original state. It's we who have transformed and evolved, and now they want to reunite with us once because once we have left and restore the original unity. Okay, they um, uh, they seemed to appear in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries, uh, so they're late appearing in folk tales. The ones that. The Grimm brothers uh, assembled, and they constituted a counterpoint as an underground reaction to the uh, to the logos value that was being nurtured in monasteries. You know, this was an age of the monk world. I mean, sometimes you just think like there was fifty uh, half the half the European population were in monasteries. You know, I mean, it was a, a monk world. And uh, uh, it's now what is a sign of a clearer and increased effectiveness of the anima in uh, consciousness. It is becoming more differentiated. And the anima being essentially feminine is predominantly conditioned by eros. Now, eros means to unite. Uh, it's the principle of relationship. It has nothing to do with the instinctive, it, it, is, it does have something to do, but it's not um, to be considered totally primitive instinctual uh, union. It is, is something much more, it is filled with magic, okay? where the instinctive uh, connections are not filled with magic. You know, uh, uh, the, it, the instinctive uh, relationships are too literal. They're overly literal. And that's, uh, that's, that's where they are dead. If they are overly literalized, they are really not. Um, they, they're, they, there's an aspect of them that has totally missed the point. Uh, you know, um, okay, I think he's figuring it out. I have a puppy trapped. <laughs> but anyway, um, the... Uh, it's the uh, principle of the union of relationship. Now, the uh, inner world is generally more bound to logos, the discriminating and the regulating principle. Just a second. I got it. Let's 
sorry. He got trapped. Okay. We'll keep plugging away at this because it's really important and I'm plowing through some of the first uh, pages of it. Uh, so they differ from swan maidens who uh, for them, uh, they, uh, the water beings always seek a love relationship to man or try to bring one about, uh, it, which is a fundamental feminine aim. Uh, it's, so they differ from the swan maidens who for the most part do not seek such a relationship of their own accord and escape at the first opportunity. Um, they they, they uh, lack psychological motive. Uh, so their relationship with man is, is just completely instinctive. And uh, so there's no meaning beyond the instinctual with uh, the swan maidens. Uh, they're very aloof. The water beings appear um, uh, particularly in Celtic regions and their motives are not solely concerned with, uh, with relationship and love, but also of transmitting the uh, res uh, it, uh, to their children or to the outer world, uh, a connection and a knowledge of nature because they are nature beings. So uh, they, uh, they often um, are, uh, teach medicine and healing. You know, they always have taboos associated with them. You can't touch them with iron. You can't speak unkind words to them. And the violations are never intentional, uh, but from heedlessness, they always occur. And um, as they're only half, and, and, and the reason they set up these laws, now this is very interesting. And that, this, this is really, uh, to me, uh, just sort of mind blowing. As, as being half human, they are ruled by inner law. You know, Jung always said that the, if the animals, um, uh, the animals are more moral than we are because they follow their inner law. We don't follow our inner law. We, um, you know, are uh, to some extent following the willfulness of ego which is completely separated from our inner law. What he called our rhizome, you know, the, the massive root that lies below the earth from which the little green spout comes out into the earth that thinks it's God, you know, that uh, is, uh, is, it ignores its inner law, you know, where, so the, the, the water beings and swan maidens as being half, only half human, cannot violate their inner law. So uh, that's sort of what this taboo aspect means, you know, that they, they are not going to, uh, they, they lack the principle of choice. And, you know, what Aniela Yaffe, who uh, was the one that, um, you know, uh, uh, took uh, down the, uh, memories, dreams, and reflections, said, yes, we have uh, uh, freedom of choice. We have the freedom of choice either to follow our inner law or not to follow it, either to follow our, uh, our destiny or be dragged by it. You know, if, if you ignore your root and your rhizome and you let it basically operate autonomously, and that means without your consciousness, it's going to go where it wants to go anyway, without a, without your knowledge or consciousness of it, and it, it it's 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 tendon. See, the rudder lies below the surface. The one that steers. That's really what your dreams are. They're a rudder, and they lie below the surface. And that rudder is set on where its uh, destination is. And if you appear on the boat, are thinking, well, I want to go this way or I want to go that way, uh, you, you're, um, it, it's not going to work. So anyway, that is their difference. Now, in the positive sense, uh, uh, there, now here's another thing uh, about them, uh, that um, they shy away from anything. Uh, humans in the positive sense, through insight, feelings, and meaning, can rise above the purely natural. So that's what they're our purposes, but we need to be conscious of the fact that that um, 
those insights, feelings, and meaning must serve the uh, our inner law. Now, uh, that same one that that governs the anima, by the way, the law that governs the anima is the law that governs us, and that's why we it is essential to unite with the archetype of life or the archetype of meaning. You know, if you're a feminine uh, or if you're female, you tend to, um, now this is generally speaking, um, need to, uh, to become more conscious of the animus, the archetype of meaning. And if you're male, generally, you need to become more conscious of the archetype of life. And that's because you specialize, you're a specialist. You know, if you're a, if you're a male, your specialist specialization lies not in relating to life, but in re- relating to your work, to uh, outer things, to uh, th- any, anything but life. Where the um, it, up until, say, the beginning of the 20th century, women in in say the 18th century and earlier. Um, had, you know, were very related to them, to tending the hearth and the biological task, some extent, to a great extent, unless they, um, you know, had been freed from that by their, uh, by uh, great wealth or something, you know. But um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, we're talking really about the inner world, not the outer social conditions. You know, now their behavior is unadapted, the anima, the nature beings, unadapted to outer ex- circumstances. They're, they're, they're related to uh, nature itself, not to culture and civilization. What seems right to them sometimes doesn't seem right to us. And if she's brought out into the outer world, um, she's uh, not of the outer world. She's of the inner world. So she's unadapted. Now she's un, she's not unadapted to the matters of individual feeling, but she is unadapted to the matters of collective feeling. So she's very close to the inner uh, to feelings of, of the individual. The collective wor- world itself finds the unconscious world, the anima, the animus, the shadow, the inferior function, dreams and visions offensive. It doesn't like them, you know, and uh, therefore they are repressed. They're much more than repressed. They're completely neglected. Uh, Nixie, so these are why the, the water beings if uh, can be quick, quickly offended and they die beneath the surface at the slightest provocation. And that's because they're completely uncoordinated with ego, you know. Um, now, that little, so little provocation is required uh, shows the fleeting images. And this is because they have not been brought in to, uh, we, we're neglecting them. So they're very shadowy. I mean, if you've ever done active imagination, you know how shadowy these figures are. And usually it takes you six months to a year to even see the shadowy figure. And, and the shadowy figures are fleeting and, uh, and uh, they, they are very, uh, it takes years to develop a, a sensitivity to the inner world through active imagination. Um, but anyway, nature beings have this irrational quality. They're good and bad, helpful and harmful. So they don't, they don't like, um, the, the reason they all went to the fairy hills is because of sermons. They don't like Christianity. It has it does not have an affinity with nature, and they are nature beings. So when they see this accretion that was put up, a, up on top of nature that's not related to nature, they flee to the fairy hills or into the earth. You know, and uh, does that surprise anyone? You know, non- nature beings are simply irrational. That means they don't, um, that means that, that they know nothing of causation and, and they live in a synchronistic world of things to where, where uh, meaningful events occur without the causal principle of uh, connecting them. 
You know, that's what uh, they mean by the irrational aspect. They're both good and bad. They're helpful and harmful. And uh, uh, they're healing and destructive, just like nature herself, because they are a part of, and they are a part of our history. Now, uh, uh, she goes, uh, you know, this was written in the 30s, but she says women tend to remain closer to nature than men. Uh, and the, and the, uh, uh, the, so that's why the man needs um, the archetype of, of life probably a little bit more than the woman does. But now what Mar Marion Woodman, you know, a more modern Jungian analyst says, that was her whole problem. Her whole life is being related to the archetype of life because the thinking of this, uh, you know, uh, God forsaken age, uh, you, you remember the uh, Philemon and Bacchus, you know, the only people that uh, recognized Hermes and Zeus were in Faust, uh, were Philemon and Bacchus, you know, and uh, uh, that's because uh, the gods are forsaken in this, this realm, you know. Okay, so um, anyway, uh, the, uh, they go on. Uh, we talk about Melissina. Uh, her, her son burns down monasteries. <laughs> you know, uh, Melissina was this half, half serpent uh, woman who uh, someone wanted to marry. Uh, uh, it was actually uh, uh, the Count of uh, William, the Count of Potiers, was one of the founders of courtly love. And he was killed by his adopted son, Raymond. And uh, Raymond runs into the forest and he sees this bathing maiden, Melissina, and uh, he wants to marry her. And uh, then he finds out later that she's half serpent and uh, all her children are crazy. And one of them burns down monasteries and, uh, uh, so the feminine, uh, she now um, the, if to marry this nature being uh, was uh, is is going to come up in Tannhauser uh, in a second. Uh, their connection with the with the human woman, but the uh, the to finish up a little bit on the water beings, um, the return to water, the life element. Uh, it's indispensable for the preservation of life, and it, um, uh, springs were often were always given religious veneration. The water of life, aqua perm permanence. The feminine has a special affinity with water, and water because water is the life element. Now, isn't this so beautiful that the uh, in the unconscious legends um, they associate the archetype of life in the feminine with water? You know which is, uh, which was given many other names. Now the name anima, and this came up last time with, uh, with Miles question, it expresses the animating character, that thing that makes things alive, you know? Um, and so it fulfills a similar function to the springs of renewal. Rational men can tend to be exposed to the dangers of dryness and desiccation, they are, they are too dry. And so they need water beings. I am going, there, since they are one-sided to the dry world, they need to associate with the moist world, the one the world that's more moist. And I'm going, here's a dream of, of such a, a, uh, a man. I am going through a dense wood, then comes towards me a woman enveloped in a dark veil who takes me by the hand and says that she will lead me to the wellsprings of life. And she's the um, uh, called Star Eyes, Lady of the Sea. And she represents connection with the source of life in the unconscious. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to I, I don't want to miss the end part here. I don't know if I'm going to get able to get over the whole thing. But um, uh, the one is. Uh, about the undying. This was a, a, a book um, called. Uh, uh, it was uh, 
a book um, uh, by Benoit uh, uh, that was inspired by um, Paracelsus, who was writing about uh, the uh, um, about the elemental beings, you know, and uh, the Undine. Uh, there's been a movie made about it, but she is this uh, one who is related uh, uh, to uh, water. And uh, um, she, the, she, she uh, when she, when the man marries her and brings her back, and he's and he knows that she's of the elfin world, he's very uncomfortable. And he had another girl that wanted to marry him, so he starts uh, dating her. And then one time she does something really odd. The uh, woman's necklace, the one, the human woman's necklace falls into the lake. Uh, Undine rescues it, but brings up uh, a necklace of seashells. And uh, then her husband curses her for being a witch. She jumps into the water and, uh, uh, you know, he, she told him, uh, and then then um, her, her human wife wants her, um, her beauty, she has some kind of elixir of eternal youth, but it's in a well that's been nailed shut. And uh, so she has that removed to get that. And then suddenly uh, the undine comes out. She goes over and gives the husband a kiss and he dies. You know, so um, there's, it is, there's a real conflict between the anima, the nature being, and the human woman. You can imagine. Why wouldn't there be? I mean, it's nature being, it remained in its natural state where it was before um, ego consciousness uh, evolved out of it. And this is what men project on human women, you know, this nature being, you know, and uh, so it is, uh, and, and we'll find out later that, um, uh, that, that this, this is the personal anima. There is something much greater that lies behind the personal anima, and that is the great mother, uh, who's you know named Cybele in some myths, and uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, who uh, both represent the goddess of nature. You know where the personal anima is just filling out our mandala. There is something universal that lies behind it. You know, and. Uh, uh, they, she goes on uh, talking a little bit about the unconscious realms, uh, which is very interesting, uh, but I think we'll skip over it. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll um, uh, she talks about that there, there's a, one that's related to the snake uh, that's um, dangerous. Uh, you, you know, it is a much more chthonic than, than the bird. And uh, it's yet it's clever, sly and wise, but it's also dangerous. It's bites poisonous, it's embrace is suffocating. And yet despite this, like the anima, the effect it exerts on men is fascinating. And who can deny that? I mean, there's an object, the snake that is just hypnotic, you know, and uh, uh, there's this, Emma Young mentions a dream of a patient who uh, saw a ring snake looking him, at him with remarkably human eyes, speaking relatedness. It's the spirit of nature appears at a snake and looks at the hero with inexpressible yearning. You know, uh, there's a, 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 it's this anima figure. Uh, Ser Serpentina is, is one of those kind. And she had a golden pot, which the land of Atlantis was mir mirrored. And uh, she helped the hero decipher uh, an emerald green leaf, a leaf drawn from nature's book. And then I, I did jump ahead here. This anima as the beast of prey and the snake is this antinea in the antitude. And now this, the, the only reason it's important, the anima as beast of prey or as uh, uh, and serpent is because this is when we um, we become dependent upon the anima, you know, and uh, 
if you become what what, what happens is and and she's going to go into this when you confuse the archetype of the of of nature the goddess of nature with the anima then you become completely her slave and what lantity does and it's a wonderful thing he says with the beauty of Be venus with the wisdom of a serpent and with the cruelty of the carnivore you can see her lion there her her cats but also her snakes um she attracted men and without exception they perish and she would put their mum mummified cor corpses arranged in her mausoleum you know and uh, th this was the one they made the movie about too and what you do by succumbing to her and and not succumbing just to the anima but, but succumbing uh to uh to the universal feminine that, that is confused with the anima, uh, that's when you experience this total dependence upon the, uh, uh, upon the anima. And that's when you become uh, someone who is uh, fascinated with the beauty of Venus and fooled by the wisdom of the serpent and the cruelty of the carnivore. And, you know, you do this uh, to some women, they, they react in an archetypal way as well. You know, I mean, they recognize that, you, well, usually one told me that she didn't want to be put up on a pedestal. And she, uh, because I did that to some woman one time when I was in my youth, you know. Um, so it's the purely d destructive. I, I want to do, I do want to get, we don't have too much time left. Uh, I just wanted to get because this I, we're going to end it today on this book, uh, but um, we want to get to uh, the um, the uh, idea of uh, the app the appropriate relationship with the anima. Okay, now uh, this uh, coming to terms with the unconscious in, is essential. And the anima's special importance is the archetype of life. And to, to, to uh, most women, the anima, uh, the, uh, coming to terms with the unconscious is also essential, but it usually involves the archetype of meaning and their bridges to the unconscious. Now, the, the male uh, first experiences this through projecting it on a living being. You know, and uh, so, but let's let's quickly get to the uh, the idea of, of what the positive relationship to anima. It's a the solution of this problem uh, problem is of special urgency today, um, and active imagination is usually required to accomplish this uh, to coming to terms with the figures of the unconscious. First, you differentiate them from ego. Now, the idea here is um, we discuss, I think, was it uh, last, or it was is a dream that we discussed, but um, uh, the idea uh, of that even your thoughts are not you. You can, you can talk to your thoughts. So this is the idea in active imagination that you are the witness. And all of everything that you think is you is not you. It's un, these are unconscious figures with whom you can um, personify and speak with. You can speak with your feet. You can speak with the anima. You can speak with your hands. You can speak with, um, in, in what uh, Jung said, with your thoughts, you know, and uh, ask them questions. But the whole idea is to differentiate them from the. Uh, this, this is this is a, a wonderful. Uh, uh, this this comes up uh, in uh, in the uh, in uh, in Hinduism. You know, uh, is uh, this um, at whose behest does the mind think? Who bids the body to live? 
Who makes the tongue speak? Who is the effulgent being that directs the eye to form and color and the ear to sound? The self is the ear of the ear, not you. The mind of the mind, not you. The speech of the speech, not you. The breath of the breath and the eye of the eye. Now, so all of these things in us are unconscious. And, you know, I told this story before, but one time I, I go into an act of imagination, very doubtful, you know, and uh, the, uh, and I said, help me get rid of that guy. I hate him. You know, I'm talking about me who, who, who thinks this is all a crazy. And uh, so, so then I, then, then I tried to picture the, the anima or the great mother or whoever I'm talking to looking at me and I have to wait until I can kind of picture myself sitting in a chair and then looking at me and then they said this who do you think you are who created this body you think the ego created this in your your hearing and your ears and your eyes and so the whole idea in active imagination is what we're doing coming to terms with the unconscious and so you differentiate them from ego, you relate to them, you, uh, you talk to them as if there's another person and you give them respect because they, they are real. You are just this little thing witnessing all of this theatrical company, which accompanies that little witness in you, you know, now, all of this other stuff is, is not you, you know, and, uh, you uh, and the and and the unconscious is grateful. You know, Young said that you make this effort and you are guaranteed a response. So the effect is felt on both sides, both in your dreams. If you do it, if you do um, your dreams, the next dream is going to respond to the work you did on this dream. So it's leading somewhere. You know. So uh, anyway, the, let let me just finish with this. Uh, Two things that one is the the nymph whose oak is endangered. Uh, a knight saves her. I told this one story last time, uh, and and saves her oak tree. And so she grants him a wish. What do you want? Fame, honors, riches, happiness, and love? No, he wants to sit in the shade of her oak uh, from the weary wanderings of war, and there from the mouth of the tree nymph who learned the wisdom of life. His wish is granted and every evening at twilight, he wanders along the reedy shores and she instructs the pupil in nature's secrets and teaches him the way to Tao of things, their natural and, and magical, their natural qualities and their magical qualities, their literal qualities and their magical qualities because they do possess both. And, uh, you know, I, I went to a shaman seminar one time with Michael Harner, where they're trying to teach you how to hear the voices of plants, of trees and flowers, you know, uh, and uh, they believe it too, you know, not any doubt. Um, so you're, you're, she, she's transforming the crude warrior into uh, uh, someone of, uh, who is embracing the wisdom world and uh, uh, as as the um, degree of his sensitivity and feeling become refined now this is talking about active imagination as the degree of his sensitivity and feeling become refined by this fair elf her fragile and shadowy reality seemed to take on solidity and substance her breast gained the warmth of life her brown eyes sparkled with fire. And along with this womanly aspect, she also seemed to acquire the feeling of blossoming maidenhood. She became more real, more alive, because man's feeling values became more differentiated to her. And uh, I mean, we told a story last time of William Sharp. If you didn't um, hear that, I, it's worth reading. Um, because uh, her, um, it, it, it's a story of a man uh, who was a friend of but William Butler Yeats, 
whose uh, really his anima did come alive and she wrote all his poetry. And there is no doubt about it. He said he could have never written any of that. And uh, he, she, he wrote under a pseudonym, uh, Fiona Cloud, and uh, he said that uh, it was his art writing, not him. But anyway, um, now we're, we're just going to get uh, to the uh, integration of the feminine element is only a portion of the anima. It's its personal aspect. The anima also represents something universal. It's the principle of womanhood, which is universal and cannot be integrated. And uh, uh, there, behind there stands the great mother and the goddess of love who represent nature. And uh, you know, here is, uh, let's see if we can get this up here. Um, there was a Cybele here. Now this is the goddess of love. I mean, the goddess of uh, the great mother, Cybele. <coughs> and uh, then also Aphrodite, who's the goddess of love. And uh, we saw her uh, before. Uh, as uh, riding on a swan, but um, she is, uh, here she is with, with, with Dionysus. Okay. Now, together, the great mother and the goddess of love uh, are the goddess of nature. That is the principle that lies behind the feminine principle and lies behind the anima. And those can never be integrated and uh, these are, that's the archetypal ground of, of the feminine. And uh, that's why the anima, who is her representative, that's one of the aspects of her being so irresistible. You know, you see the feminine form and what she speaks to you is of both nature and love. You know, you see her form, it speaks to you of life. You know, Marion Woodman says, that the, the woman's pelvis really is a cradle. It's, it's a cradle of, of, of new life. It, it really literally is. The fact that it is that, uh, you know, can hold that baby there. And then the aspect of, of the, um, the uh, milk giving breasts also is a hint of, uh, of the archetype of life. So when you are projecting onto this, um, form that no one can help having, you know, uh, I was born male accidentally, you know, <laughs> didn't ask to be male, you know, you are seeing Cybel and Aphrodite, okay, they can never be integrated though, and uh, uh, anyway, I think, uh, yeah, we don't have any time left before we have some questions, but um, the, uh, there's anything that we can hit with. with uh, well, um, let me see if I can just finish a little bit. Confusing the two aspects is what gives the anima her irresistible power. It's very important to discriminate between what belongs to the personal anima and what belongs to the universe. You know, uh, there was a dream of a veiled woman, uh, more than life size, who was in the place of the altar. Uh, the, she's the great mother, the goddess of love, the, uh, uh, the anima um, uh, ar archetype who's to be met with reverence. Now, my anima told me that she did not want to be worshipped. She wanted, she wanted to be my partner. So she's identifying herself as the personal anima, you know. Yet when you meet the great mother or the uh, goddess of love, you know, she is to be met with reverence. And uh, um, now she finishes with this, uh, that, um, uh, that um, the intellectual view that's dominant in this era of science and technology leads to, uh, to uh, well, well, she says, first of all, let me, I, I left out the important part is that um, when the anima is recognized and integrated, a change of attitude brings about almost a reverence 
for nature, for the land, for the place with, that we dwell in. And, and we have to remember we are bodies and we're living in a landscape. And, you know, uh, no matter what landscape it is, it seems to uh, speak to us, you know. And, uh, but then she finishes with this. The intellectual view dominant in this era of science and technology leads to utilizing and exploiting this thing that we uh, unite with when we unite with the universal uh, goddess of nature. It splits peoples, individuals, and atoms. And she says it's... Um, it, it is uh, life is founded on the harmonies and the interplay of the masculine and feminine forces and with the individual and without bringing these forces into union is the most important task of our time. It's uh, um, she's saying that those things that we're splitting need to be uh, united. Anyway, um, that kind of gives us a little bit of a picture of, of who the animate is. I mean, to me, it's a lot different. I mean, with this perspective, and I think later we'll bring out some of the things Hillman says, because he really fleshes it out too, of uh, all of this. Now, uh, uh, Gary, you, why don't uh, you turn, all, turn take it over, but maybe, you know, one question before the house is, uh, it, was this the impression of the anima you had? <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've got to say, the you know, one of the things that has me puzzled is take the, the swan maiden and her form. And, and basically, you know, she doesn't desire a relationship with us. And in order to get this relationship, we have to steal her cloak of feathers so that she, you know, can't fly away. Um, and, you know, I don't, some, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that this would be something that would come in dreams very often. So it's mostly going to be in fairy tales. And that makes, and of course, fairy tales are, you know, this is really representing kind of the collective unconscious the response to, you know, things that, that we're not, you know, very aware of that, you know, are sort of the opposite of what we're doing. So, you know, is, is the way that you use something like that? I mean, is it, is that like a place where you should be using active imagination to, to try to figure out like, oh, you know, what, what part of my life have I, you know, maybe and captured, you know, captured something and forced it to my will. Because to me, it sounds like most of the Swan Maiden stories are we are trying to bend, you know, an elemental part of nature to our wills. And maybe that's, uh, maybe that's not quite right. Well, I think as she's saying it is more archaic, you know, it is, is something that before the anima was more differentiated, then it became closer to the earth, you know, in the form of the, uh, of the water beings. But I just wanted to uh, say that, the, 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 that it might not come in the form of the swan, it could come in the form of swan in your dreams, but it, it, uh, she does mention the dream of a young man you know, uh, who happens to be uh, her husband, you know, uh, uh, where she, he is in this, uh, sitting in, a, in this kind of a palatial uh, setting and uh, uh, they, uh, suddenly a white bird descends, a small seagull or dove. So it's bird form and gracefully, gracefully came to rest on the table and I signed the children to be still so they would not frighten away the pretty bird. And immediately the dove was transformed into a little girl, someone, an anima that's undeveloped, you know, in young. And uh, uh, it seems the water beings are, are more mature, you know, and about eight years of age with golden blonde hair, she ran off with the children and played with them among the colonnades of the castle. 
I remained lost in thought, musing about what I had just experienced. The little girl returned and tenderly put her arms around my neck. Then she suddenly vanished. She's, she's half human too, see? Only half human. And she can't maintain her human form very long. But what she says, only in the first hours of the night can I transform myself to a human being when the male uh, dove is busy with the 12 dead. And then she flew off into the blue air and I awoke. Um, now, it's just interesting when the, fe when the feminine or the anima comes in, up in an animal form, what animal is she? You know, um, you know, for me, for a long time, I'm from Norway, it tended to be uh, reindeer. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Well, go, go ahead, Gary. You just go around the room and see if everybody. Yeah, I've just got one other thing. Um, and that is, and I'm, I'm, I went ahead and put it in chat. These are links to an idea called commonplace or commonplace. And, and what I was thinking is that for this part of the meeting, you know, if somebody, you know, wanted to take like, you know, anywhere from like five to 20 minutes and talk about something that's related to this, not the indigenous of Canada, <laughs> but, you know, if they wanted to like, you know, try to pull together, you know, something and, 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 you know, and talk about it, you know, that we could do that. And that way it doesn't have to be a fixed period of time. And, and the idea behind commonplacing is that you, you know, you, you know, you're taking these ideas and, and like, you know, sometimes you might be drawing like mind maps, you might have images that you think that you're relating. And then it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's a way of putting a series of things together and then discussing it. And I suspect that, you know, that you do this just really naturally, Craig, and that's how you come up with some of these talks. But, you know, the material that we're going through is so, is so rich. And this is a way to kind of, you know, encourage us to, you know, try to put it together for ourselves and then bring that, you know, experience over to the group. Well, um, that's certainly, you can take a lot more than five to 20 minutes. If, if someone would like to just um, make a presentation during our uh, whole uh, hour, they're certainly welcome to. Uh, I'm always yeah. welcome that. I mean, we've had one. I think Tim's done one. Jordy's done one. Uh, oh, yeah. Both you know, very so, enjoyable. So any, yeah, Tim's was very good. And so was Jordy's. But Jordy had actually a PowerPoint for it. But yeah, so, so that's actually, always a possibility. Yes. I actually tried this just for grins when I went to the gardens with a friend. And it was funny because I had all these notes. And I kind of glanced at the first page. And then I just talked. I didn't even end up using the notes. And so... You know, I think this is a good way of kind of coagulating some of the stuff in our minds. Um, so just a thought, if, you know, if anybody's interested. So I'll go ahead and go around, though. Uh, Tim, it looks like you've got something ready to say. Go ahead. Well, I'm just appreciating all this. Um, we've got a lot of people here, so I don't want to take too much time. But one thing that that Craig talked about was was the voice of the unconscious saying, um, I can't remember exactly, but uh, kind of talking about did you know did did you come up with these thoughts? Did you and that th make I, that your body me. or make your ear? Yes, exactly. And this reminded me so much of God's argument in Job at the at the very end of the story when Job says, well, "What the hell, God?" and and God says, "Well." Did you make the universe? You know, it's, it's kind of like a, it's a very parallel kind of uh, argument. Well, I was doubting her reality. Uh, I was doubting her reality. And she's telling me, you're doubting my reality. <laughs> what is your reality? Where, give me the percentage of you that is you. You know, right. it's just a tiny little seed, you know. You're devouting my reality, you know. I mean, that's kind of what she was saying. Yeah, this is this is all really rich stuff, and and I really hope we can do some of this commonplacing. I think that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, 
have to get Jan to do her anima one, you know? Yeah, exactly. So are, are you done, uh, yeah. Tim? Okay, Annette, do you, do you have something to say? Yeah, I was, I was actually also something also I'd like to respond to you, Gary, uh, when you said like, you feel kind of the swan maiden very inaccessible almost, like she's so hidden or far away. And I know that, uh, say, Arnold Mandel often worked with people also in kind of extreme states, like in coma or, you know, and uh, did basically active imagination with them. And there was quite a communication between them and, and sometimes beautiful things happened. And uh, uh, yeah, maybe I, I can share that. But so I think the swan maybe could be an extreme state, inner state, or something. I don't know if if that is to be seen like that. You know, I don't know. How oh, fascinating! Mm -hmm. Well, now you've got to promise to bring us, you know, a talk next time for however long no, you no. want. No, no, <laughs> you have to do it. You know, it could be five, ten minutes, whatever. You know, about how you did this because this sounds like just a perfect example of active imagination and you know and i think like you know especially a lot of times you know all of us end up having to deal with people that are you know close to us that are close to death you know in a coma and we want to know ways to like how can we interact with them and and it sounds like what you were doing is just a perfect example so you know you have to call yeah, us next time to talk about this. Yeah, and actually Arnold Mindell has written about that. So I, I can I can show his work rather than my own. I can show his work then for you if you want to. Great. Oh, that would be great. Yes, by all means. Thank you. Arnold Mindell is that guy I told you about where the where the woman just comes in, looks in the phone book and dials up his number and, and tells him, you know, hey, you're <laughs> pleasuring yourself too much and and then 20 years later, he's in a cabin in Oregon. It's the same woman knocking on the door, you know, and she's got messages from him for him from the other side. He, he like uh, Adolf Guggenbull Craig and some other people of, of, the, of the young, and with Hillman, were emphasizing more the body. They seem to say that the body is the wisdom of nature, you know, it really is. But that, that's great in that. Yeah. Jorge, do you have something to say? No, no, no. I'm just trying to digest the readings. I, I found really, really interesting the, the part where, Craig, you said, um, I, I thought a part of the individuation process was to integrate the whole anima. Now I can see it's not possible. It's only a part of it, the, the personal anima. Yeah, that was a that was a revelation to me too. I mean, what she's saying is that we need to become a mandala. In other words, you need to in, integrate the personal anima within us, which gives us the bridge to the universal, you know, uh, realm. And that and that rudder within us, our our root is different. My root is different from your root or from this person's root. And we all, uh, we all, all are pushed towards a certain area. And I think this, this is the, the idea of, of, of the swan maiden. Uh, it, there's an aspect of the anima is the one who pushes you in the direction you need to go. Okay. Now, see, that's kind of the, why the swan maiden is not interested in love. But the, uh, the, uh, uh, the water being then says, yes, but you also need to have feeling. You know, you can't only just accomplish things. You need to also relate to me, you know. And uh, so that was kind of the water beings. I think that's that was sort of how I uh, interpreted it. But it's like you say, Jorge, it's, it's news to me, but it's very beautiful, you know, uh, that, that the archetype that lies behind the anima is, uh, you know, can never be integrated because it's nature herself. Yeah. Thank you. you know, that's really interesting you saying that, you know, this is, and this is out of the feminine and fairy tales. One of the main tasks of therapeutic treatment, therefore, is to try to enrich 
the range of emotional reactions so that the vessel is larger and more solid and can receive the emotional impulses from the unconscious, that there are various forms of disharmony. Well, actually, that's the main part of it. So, you know, but that enriching the range of emotional, you know, responses that we can have, I mean, to me, you know, that's one of the real beauties of active imagination is that you're allowing those things which have not had a voice to have a voice. And if it has a voice, then, you know, now you're going to be able to start seeing emotions that, you know, if they haven't had a voice are likely to have been repressed. If you can become like that man under the oak tree, who wants to hear the tree nymph telling them the wisdom of life, you don't need an analyst. Right. I mean, she is your analyst. I mean, if you really take this seriously, and at, at that point, even, uh, you know, organized religions and stuff, uh, they don't speak to you like she does. But anyway, thank you. Uh, Nicola, would you have something to say? You're, you might be uh, muted. No, I'm just uh, overwhelmed by the information and um, try to integrate it in the own process I've been through uh, for years and trying to, to make a work out of it or make a presentation of it. So um, I have necessary information here and Sometimes I'm getting coming to tears uh, from the words uh, and the experience. I've experienced the archetype of nature. Um, so it's difficult to, to indeed, you, you can't integrate it and you can't find words or you, you can't share it. That's the difficult. And I'm, I'm in that conflict with myself at the moment and trying to find um, words, images, to, to give it back. Well, actually, I think that's really well put, you know, because I, I go through the same problem. When we go through these things, there's yeah. just so much that you can't integrate it. And that's that was part of why I said, hmm, need to mm -hmm. put up this whole idea of the commonplace. And because then what you do is you take it, you know, you, you write things down, you, you know, you see the connections and then you, you know, and then maybe you have something that you can give like a little talk on and share, it, you know, mm -hmm. I and so, yeah, by all means, you know, put that together and then integrate it and then, you know, share with us I'm next time. I'm working on it. That's, okay. But I'm a little bit scared to do it too, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always hard, you know, in front of yeah. a group. You know. Well, you, you know, one thing I think we could do uh, along with this commonplace is just one session, maybe even the next session if you want to, is we'll have an unrecorded session where mm -hmm. everybody just tells us uh, um, about just their path, you know, just, uh, you know, everyone just tells uh, uh, where the, you know, kind of whatever they want to share about where they are today, you know, and how they got there and what they're seeking now. You know, mm -hmm. uh, something that's always so fascinating to hear mm -hmm. because, uh, uh, you know, everyone has, uh, uh, you know, this swan going across the lake, but those feet below are just going like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's let's schedule that, Gary, if you yeah, if, if you can. Well, and I think, you know, really, you can just like send a note to Craig or whatever and, and you know, and just say, oh, you know, I've got this. I'm guessing it'll be like five minutes, but if it goes 15, that's fine. Uh, Miles, do you have anything to say? Uh, yeah, uh, I guess, first of all, you said you would like to hear from people, but not about the indigenous people in Canada. And so yeah, I wanted to be I've shared, I've shared so much content about the indigenous people of, who are my neighbors. Is that why I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little oh, bit yeah, more why I mean, you don't want to hear any more about that as well, which is, I guess, my complex that I've talked about quite a bit. Yeah. So, so on ahead. that, you know, it's like, how do we, how do we keep the group kind of focused within, uh, you know, the main area of topic and, and to me, you know, 
although it's it's interesting, it's kind of outside what the group is. So that's what I was thinking. But you know, if you can relate it, not so much a story about them, but to a story to integration within yourself, you know, mm -hmm. then that's yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from with that. And it's a it is a very tough. It is a it is a complex for me, so I I'm educating myself. So I probably share too much education as opposed to, uh, you know, what is actually um, happening in you personally. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that is your way, Miles. I think you are finding uh, your way through uh, through the Indigenous people of Canada, and why you do is because it is. They have, they have the goddess of nature speaking to them. You know, I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. I mean, uh, I yeah, sent that yeah, yeah. letter out of the, uh, read that letter of the chief of Seattle, uh, the chief of Seattle. It just spoke to that last paragraph of, uh, of the, uh, of, uh, um, of what uh, she wrote. But the, yeah, that's, that's how I think would, would be how, um, now, what what practices are you developing from the individual ended uh, from what well i'll just are... share i'll share a very quick anecdote so i i was at uh, my nephew's wedding last night and uh, you know, what you talked about how in paragraph 60 uh the nixie who lives in the waters that is in the unconscious represents the feminine in a semi-human, almost unconscious state. And it goes on to say, it is a fact that one's unconscious personality components, the anima, animus and shadow, or one's inferior functions are always those which the world finds offensive and which are therefore repressed again and again. And in a at a wedding you're sort of you're concerned about you know what you might say if you will provide any sort of a speech and and um and when you're speaking from the heart which we don't often have the opportunity to, to do so because uh, the nature of our secular uh, modern world of uh, you know the industrial capitalism uh, you're you are very hesitant to speak your heart right because oh somebody will raise their eyebrows uh, about um, you know what you might be sharing from the heart as opposed to just living in this ego conscious uh, that we tend to be very focused uh, in our modern world of in, in valuing valuing thinking only. So anyway, the, the upshot of it was I didn't say anything, and I sort of regret it. But <laughs> thank you for that lesson. Oh, well, that's it, that's really tragic because you know you could have you could have mentioned all the unmentionables that actually need to be said. You know. <laughs> well, in, in that story, the the the. Uh, you, you know, the uh, man, the husband takes the water being to a wedding and she cries. And then he takes her to a, a, a funeral and she laughs. And then he, and he, she takes him or he takes her to a christening and she doesn't want to go because it's a Christian, right? So it was just this, this is who she Yeah, in fact, in fact that, that's what I was wanting to share was some of this, these uh, concepts that we're talking about and what, Carl Jung brought forth, has brought forth and made me now aware of the concepts. Um, and and I, I, again, I just thought, okay, I better just shut up because people would raise their eyebrows and what the hell is he talking about kind of thing. So anyway. That, that was Black Elk was one of these people, one of these backwards people who, you know, always does everything that, uh, that civilization does not expect. But uh, it kind of reminded me of him. Oh, go ahead, Gary. Thank you, Miles. Yeah. No, also, Azim has a question. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Um, so my question is about the, the luminal space and the ethics of luminal space. Um, last time you spoke um, 
about this, uh, I think William Sharp and um, how he was not presenting um, his work under his own name and under the name of Fiona and um, also about the presence of ego. I think um, the interesting um, thing about active imagination is not just the presence of the elements of the unknown, but also the presence of the ego. That's actually the difference between dreaming and actual Im active imagination, because in dream, the ego is uh, asleep. So the unconscious has the opportunity to come uh, along. But in active imagination, I, I think the key is that, um, is building up a relationship the conscious relationship between ego and the unconscious elements. So um, I think it's necessary because I work with students, I teach active imagination courses and I see a lot of flooding when they start uh, doing active imagination. Uh, we get easily overwhelmed by the power um, of these um, elements. So we have to be able to set boundaries even with the with these powerful um, elements of unconscious. Otherwise, uh, they will overwhelm us. And I think the, uh, the key to this um, relationship is thinking about the um, concept, of, concept of yin and yang and how yin has been translated wrongly as passive while yin is receptive. So, um, as ego, when we are doing the active imagination, we need to be re receptive. And I don't know how, probably there's a lot of differences between the states of dreaming and um, being in this mythologic um, space where we were talking about the swan who, did, who didn't want to connect to this person, but you have to steal the feathers and stuff, which is really an active uh, approach to um, these elements. But I just wanted us to think uh, about this space. And um, I wanna ask what you think about the presence of the ego, the importance of the presence. I'm not talking about not being humble. Uh, and receptive, but um, I think it's important, at, at least in active imagination, uh, for the ego to be present and being able to set boundaries and stuff. Yeah, that, so you're not overwhelmed or extinguished. You know, yeah. um, the, the receptivity is very important. It's the ability to listen. You know, that's what the, uh, they say, is that passive? No, it's not passive. It's, it's, it's your, at, you are actively uh, listening. Yes. And um, uh, now, now the idea, if you read some of Young's conversations in the Red Book, he's, he's a hard ass, you know. Yeah. That. I mean, he is, he's challenging them on every point, you know. And the whole idea is he is really, trying to get them to to respond in kind you know to uh to uh, you, you know he goes in there he's he was like um who, who was that figure uh that uh, he caught was it Codius or somebody you know he he was gonna catch and he wanted to force an answer out of him uh, uh to, to to you know how he did that with every unconscious thing figure. Now, he, he, I, I tend to be a little more, uh, I don't know about you, as in, I tend to be a, a little more the this, this student and not the, uh, and, and the whole idea is what I, Young was very, uh, you know, very accomplished at this. I mean, and first of all, he said the difference between me and everyone else is they're opaque and I'm transparent, you know. Well, I tend to be uh, more of the opaque type, you know, so I'm trying to soften that up so that I can. Now, it's, it's so important. What do all these unconscious contents want? They want the light of awareness. Yeah. So what, what is the role of the ego? Because of the light of awareness. 
if you're not, the, if the light of awareness doesn't shine on this thing, they're unopened letters, thousands of unopened letters written by uh, Mozart, uh, Goethe, uh, you know, uh, James Joyce that are sent to you. You know, Rumi, every, all of these people, they, you, the, the, but you won't be able to read all these beautiful letters unless the light of awareness pays attention to them. You know, now the, the idea in alchemy is that we become the empty vessel for the contents of the unconscious, you know, but I, I think what you're saying too, Azine, is very important too. Uh, they had a German word for this, this sitting down and having a, a, a con, a, you know, a coming to terms with uh, the unconscious. In other words, you, your standpoint needs to be taken into account, you know, and, and but their side, there, there's this, um, this uh, uh, very famous, uh, the idea of the, of, of the, um, the, the symbol of justice where the, the woman is blind, she holds a scale and uh, uh, the scale is evenly balanced means listen to both sides. So I think that's kind of the principle of, of the unconscious uh, and the ego, but, the, but without the light of attention, nothing happens. That was one thing I, I wanted uh, to stress uh, what she's, uh, what Emma Young says is just the, the crime of the neglect of, of the unconscious. That just the, the, the us neglecting the unconscious, we are neglecting them. The, we are neglecting the reality of ourselves when we do that. The most genuine aspect of ourselves uh, through not lending at the light of ego attention, and it and these unconscious contents long for the light, and they are so grateful when you give them that attention. Yeah, I think. Um especially at the beginning it, it's very, it's really easy to get overwhelmed and you get excited and you want to talk about it i saw this i saw this it was fantastic but um i think um what is important is uh, focusing on building a healthy relationship between ego and unconscious otherwise you see these images you you have um this um elements coming through but, uh, and they're excited as well to come to light, but I think the process um, is about, it's, it's not just about seeing them, it's about integrating them into our daily lives and just and sending them back to unconscious uh, in a complete circle, you know? So I yeah. think uh, these are the things that we have to, uh, I don't know how we should approach uh, fairy tales or dreams. Maybe it's different, but with active imagination, I think these two elements, uh, these factors are important. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, it's such an important topic. Is that, you know, I think this might this might also make a, another good talk. You know, <laughs> yeah, the images uh, that we see in the unconscious. Uh, are sort of um, so sometimes they come in threes or fours. You need you need to uh, they 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 seem like they come uh, in a series, and you sometimes need at least a few data points before one makes any sense. You know, one all by itself may make sense, but it usually if, if they there's two more in that same session that you can connect with, or three more. Then, then you can start to make sense of it. But, but the whole idea is that just the image itself means nothing. What, uh, unless it's so numinous you can, and you can't miss it. But the idea is that the ego needs to be the ex medium of expression for the image in the outer world. You need to draw it and color it or something like that. So it's more concrete and real now. You know, and so it's it's acquired substance. Okay, that's what it wants: concreteness and substance. And then the other aspect is to uh, throw, uh, surround it with 
uh, amplifications or words, you know, and uh, um, that was, uh, uh, that, that's the uh, archetype of meaning. So one is the archetype, of, you're giving it both expression, life, concreteness, substance, and the other one is the amplification side where you're giving it, you are trying to find its, its, its symbolic import. Now, sometimes it, what Hillman says that you can't really, uh, sometimes you don't understand the image, you don't understand the dream, don't worry, it understands you. If you feel, yeah, if you feel resonance and, and reverberations from it, it doesn't matter whether it's, uh, you know, telling you to turn left or turn right or, or sit down, stand up or lay down. You know, it doesn't uh, necessarily give directions, you know, but it, it does, it, it's stunning. Like an artwork is stunning. You know, it has this, there was this, uh, go, go ahead, Gary. I wanted to, uh, what Azeen said, it brought up something I skipped over, but I see we should, what Jordy probably has. We should probably go on. Uh, and Jordy, uh, or Jordy. Jordy, yeah, yeah. So Jordy, go ahead. Uh, today, for the, to me, too many things, uh, intense things and connections we trigger, say, autonomous strength of thought. So it was uh, plenty of diverse, diverse materials. Just, I would like to highlight one aspect that Craig mentioned, say, half an hour ago of the point of awareness that you listen to what you are listening and you are looking to the eyes that are looking. That there is an inner element, which is you, but it's not you. Uh, in meditation, it's called the witness, that the, the witness function. And in it, there is a strong tradition in Asia on that. I think the, the word it's used is sakshit, S-A-K-S-H, which is the witness. Now, I am not going to do a West, West, Mid, East, but there is an element of that. And there are plenty of ways of training that. Uh, that's a common thing, say, in Zen, Zen Buddhism, but also in Vipassana or Theravada Buddhism and other traditions, not all related to Buddhism. My point is that this thing can be trained independently of, uh, of your deep psychology. And it's useful. Yeah. Now, I look forward to participate in non-recorded sessions. Yes. Uh, I, um... As a matter of fact, I did enjoy a lot the presence of Jen when he was alive on those. Yeah, I think she had to go early or something. Yeah. But yeah, we'll always. Um, why don't we, uh, uh, if if you like, uh, we could just do that next uh, week. I'll, I'll check with everybody if that's okay with them. And next week, maybe everyone can just tell their story, and that's all we're going to do. Is just, and you don't have to tell your story, but you can just. Um, where are you? What what is it? What is it that you're working on? Uh, what fascinates you? What questions you have? Whatever, you know. I, I think that would be very uh, to me. That's always magical. And then plus we get to know each other, and there's a little more cohesion, you know, uh, uh, rather than just me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this these this material is pretty dense. I was gonna just. Uh, say uh, one, one thing that Azim uh, said that that I skipped over uh, this this was uh, one thing I skipped over the meaningful factor in the unconscious is what makes it possible for consciousness to develop this factor is comparable to the lu lumen natura it's this invisible light that reaches man as if in a dream and since now this is this is what I was this last line is what I this, you know, just blew me away. Since the light of nature cannot speak, it builds shapes in dreams from the power of the word. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, now I was thinking of that when Azine mentioned, 
these images that come up in uh, active imaginations. Since the light of nature cannot speak, it builds uh, shapes in dreams from the power of the word. You know, I mean, it, I, I just could, I mean, that just spoke to me, you know, very eloquently. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sophia, do you have anything you'd like to say? And you'll have to unmute if you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, un yeah, unmute, unmute. So, Sophie, if you could. I'm very new to this, so I'd rather listen now. And, you know, okay, just, great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you well, so much. Yeah, well, thank you for being here, Sophia. And uh, I, I think what, what, what we can do next time uh, is, uh, at least for uh, the, as long as it, uh, people have anything to say, um, let's, let's just uh, have everybody have five to... 10 minutes, however long they want to take to just talk about um, what interests you, you know, and I don't care whether it has anything to do with young or not, you know, uh, young, uh, you, you know, young really is just a supplement to your own inner work, by the way. That's what oh, I, I become. Yeah, go ahead, Sophia. I've been in Gurdjieff's work for 10 years, yes. but somehow... Jung just entered my life. So I'm just, you know, wide open and just listening. And well, you're not the only one that has uh, Gurdjieff. Uh, who was it? Someone else was mentioning Gurdjieff uh, recently. I forget who it was. But anyway, uh, maybe you can tell us about that, Sophia. We'll start next time without recording. And um, everyone, uh, uh, we'll just give everybody a chance to go around and spend as long as you want just talking about uh, whatever you want. And if we run out of time, I mean, everybody's done talking, then we'll uh, go, we'll start, um, we're gonna start, and I wanna just say a little bit about uh, Anima and Animus in fairy tales. It's a short book. Um, you're gonna find like the first fairy tale, Rink Rank, it's about a, uh, a, a guy who the, the woman shuts his beard in a window. I mean, she, that's how she gets, control of the animus you know who had control of her is she shuts his beard in a window and gets him to do what to let her go and uh the these lectures are um were written by a uh, daryl sharp who is from canada by the way and uh um there some of them are a little sparse now the the feminine in fairy tales are really essays so they're going to be a little more uh we'll learn a little bit more from them but um anyway uh so next time why don't we do that we'll just start out not recording and everyone can say whatever just tell us what your story and i miles i want to hear your story i mean i'm fascinated by your story i think what gary's saying is about all of us not just you is uh what is our path you know our individual path you know and uh um i blather on as much as anybody about the stuff so <laughs> you can uh accuse me of that but anyway uh thank you so much and miles uh i'm looking forward to your uh, uh thing you sent on the lakota too i haven't had a chance to see it but anyway i unless anybody else has got anything to say we'll uh reconvene next sunday so Thanks, Annette, and Tim, and Gary, and Jorge, and Nicolette, Miles, Zine, Sophia, Jordy, and Dawn, especially. And uh, next time, and Jan. We'll see you guys next time then. Okay. Thanks, guys. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>